Today I'm going to be explaining how to use the MicroCal BPITC instrument. So this instrument measures thermodynamic interactions between protein and protein that are protein small molecule interactions or any interaction that involves a change in heat. So the biggest thing with ITC is that the instrument is clean and your samples are dialyzed in the exact same buffer. And I'm of course happy to go through that with you. So now I'm going to show you how to turn the instrument on, rinse everything out, and actually what I'll be putting in is just a water uh, sample in the syringe and in the cell. So the cell is in here, and so to turn the instrument on, I can find it here, is the power switch back there. So we'll let it turn on. The power light will hopefully go on at some point. And so in here, there are two, uh, there are two holes. Can you see it? Oh, there you go. On the left is the reference cell, which has water in it. So I change that periodically to have fresh water in there. So you really don't need to change it uh, when you come to use the instrument and make sure that's fresh. And the right is the hole for the sample cell. The volume of the sample cell is about 1.4 milliliters. Honestly, I have people make about two milliliters of sample if you can. This is the injection or titration syringe. And so this is where you'll be putting your other sample and then eventually putting this syringe in here and starting the injection process. Okay, so I turned it on, but what I also have to do is open the software. So the software is the MicroCal VPITC that runs the instrument. The analysis software is something different. So it's initializing the system right now. And what you want to make sure, actually, uh, we can keep it to 30 degrees, but it takes a lot longer for the ITC to cool down than heat up. So if you're planning on running your sample at 25 degrees or room temperature, you may want to change this to 24 or 25 degrees, just so it can establish that baseline before you start your run. Okay, so now we are going to prepare our samples. Again, this is just water. For both your sample going into the cell and into the injection syringe, you're gonna to wanna to degas them, like I mentioned. So we use these sample tubes that fit in the degasser. So again, I'm just using water as an example. And as I mentioned, two milliliters is the perfect amount. And so what you wanna do is take these tiny stir bars that's already been pre-rinsed with water and put it in here. So this has a stirring speed, which you can adjust. And so it's actually stirring in there. If you look, it should be, yep. Yeah. So it's actually stirring in there. And in addition to stirring, you can put this on here, attach this in the back, and then flick the switch over to the timer. And so it will degas for five minutes. And also, again, if you're running your samples at a lower temperature or a higher temperature, you can pre-equilibrate your samples to the desired temperature. So. so while your sample is degassing, you also want to rinse out the sample cell and the injection syringe with your buffer of choice. So again, I'm just using water, and but pretend this is your buffer. And another thing that ITC does not like are bubbles. So you wanna kinda try and get all of them out of the Hamilton syringe. I know there are a lot of syringes. And so to rinse this out, you just simply inject it slowly into the sample cell and then remove it. Alternatively, if you want to run a large volume of buffer or water or cleaning solutions through the sample cell, you can use the vacuum pump. 
So here, you can put this again into your sample cell, not the reference cell. You can put your line into your buffer of choice. And then switch out this line for this. And so now the vacuum pump will draw your buffer through to the flask. And you can see that water is now flowing through there. And once it runs out in here, which it will do relatively quickly, um, but it's a very convenient way to run a large amount of buffer through. Okay, so now there's pretty much air in there. Uh, we can turn this off. We can double check that all of the liquid is out using our Hamilton syringe. And so that just, you wanna make sure you get rid of your residual buffer. Okay, so similarly, you want to rinse out your injection titration syringe with your buffer of choice before loading your degassed sample. So for this, we want to use these small tubes. Um, these are just glass tubes. And so the way the syringe is set up it actually draws from the bottom. There's a small hole down here and basically a Teflon plunger up here. So what we're going to do is attach yet another syringe and pull it through to kind of rinse everything. So you want to slowly put a sample tube on here. We'll put the buffer in. We'll put the buffer in in a second. You want to be careful not to bend the injection syringe or, you know, run into it in any way. And you also want to make sure that the fill port is in the open position, which it is because you can see the little white Teflon plunger is above this port right here. If it's not, you can control that uh, through the computer. So you can pipette in approximately 700 microliters of, again, just your buffer right in there so it's filled up that small glass culture tube and then we're going to use this syringe with this tubing attach the tubing to this port right here and then pull back slowly on this syringe to again draw your buffer through the titration syringe so everything is in the same buffer. So now we're ready to put our degas samples in the sample cell and the injection syringe. So for degas samples, remember they're in these tubes, you take your Hamilton syringe, the cell only holds about 1.4 mils, but having a little extra will not hurt. Again, you don't want any bubbles, so kind of get those out. And again, you want to inject this into the right hole, the sample cell, not the left one, which is the reference. And so what I do is I put the syringe all the way down to the bottom where I can feel it, lift up a little bit, and slowly inject my sample while drawing up the syringe because if you get air in there you can kind of go up and down a little bit all right that's pretty good okay and yeah you can't really tell anything <laughs> And then you can put your ligand that you want to titrate into the injection syringe. Let's see if I have enough. Oops. 
I have some air in here. That's not the greatest thing, but. There would be no air. Yeah, pretend there would be no air. <laughs> I might add a little bit more. We can edit this part out. No. So now we're loading our titrant sample. So again, I hooked up this tubing to the fill port there. I'm pulling back slowly. You don't want to pull it back so fast that there's air at the bottom of your injection syringe. So you can see it's slowly coming up here. And so you can see that there's a little bubble at the top. And so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to go to the computer, hit close fill port, and then also pull back a little bit as it's going. And now that bubble is pretty much gone. So it's in the closed port position. If your sample is precious, which most likely it is, right? You can recover it by putting this back into an Eppendorf or something. But to make sure there aren't any bubbles in the injection syringe, what you wanna do is hit the purge refill button. And so what this will do, it will push that Teflon plunger down. You will see an increase in volume here because again, it's pushing the liquid through here and then it will draw it back up. And so if you see bubbles coming out of here, which we do not, but if you see those, um, make sure you have enough sample so when it refills, you don't have any air um, in your titration syringe. And so now it's reversing and now it's drawing up the sample. And you'll know when it's done, when it beeps, and when you see that little Teflon plunger. All right. So now that your sample is loaded into the sample cell and you have your ligand loaded into the injection syringe, you're going to physically lift up the injection syringe and put the syringe in again to the sample cell. And what you want to make sure is that you put it in and then you hear it click down. Okay, then you wanna to come to the computer. And here it's really dependent on your experiment. So what you can change is the total number of injections, the temperature. I usually don't mess with the reference power, it's calibrated pretty nicely, or the initial delay before injection. What is very important for ITC is knowing the exact concentration of your sample in the syringe and your exact concentration of your sample in the cell. So you can input these, this is water, so I have zero. You can adjust the stirring speed if you would like. You can also adjust how many microliters for each injection it's going to inject, how long those injections are taking, and the time in seconds between injections. So these are all pretty standard to start with, but if you would like, you can adjust those um, for your experiment. Once you have all of that set up and you've put in a name other than default, then all you do is go to the start button. And mine are invalid because it's water, I have zero. Um, no. Okay, so then it's really boring for a really long time because it will go through a whole equilibration process to make sure it's the exact temperature that you set it at and the baseline does not drift significantly. Okay. Once your run is complete, you will see the raw data, which is not here for my run, I didn't let it finish. But if you would like to analyze your data, what you wanna go to is this piece of software here, the MicroCal Analysis Launcher. You wanna pick the VPITC, because that's the instrument that we're using. This is based on Origin software. And so what you wanna do is click read data, and it's a little cumbersome to find your data. Whoever set this up, not me. Anyway, you wanna to go to C, VPITC, data, and I'll just show you a previous water run that I performed. 
Now, since this is, so this is um, the KCAL for mole of injectant. If you would like to see the raw um, ITC values, I think that's this one, yeah. And so you can see this is very zoomed in because we would not expect big um, changes in enthalpy with water, water. Um, so you can see, yes, there's a little bit of a baseline drift, but these are pretty small. Hopefully, if you see real interaction, this data would be much bigger. And then if you would like to go to a final figure, go there where you have your raw ITC on top and you see how it nicely kind of brings up the baseline. And then again, since this is water, water, this is all scatter, you don't really need to fit the data. However, if you would like to fit the data, let's say you actually have a beautiful binding curve, you can make sure you're on the Delta H window and there are several different choices in binding models. One set of sites, two set of sites. And you can look up the math for all of it. N refers to the molar ratio. If you have a one-to-one -one binding situation, this would be close to one. K is your Ka, so it's your K association. And H is enthalpy. And so you can change these to have different starting values if you would like fix one or you can have them check so they can vary but basically all I do is hit 200 iterations this curve fit of course is going to be terrible because there's no <laughs> real binding there but pretend you had nice binding and then that's how you get your KD and some thermodynamic parameters because once you hit done this will give you your N your K your Delta H and your Delta S and so that will give you all of that information when your run is complete and you've analyzed your data, or even before then, you want to take out the injection syringe. Again, be careful not to bend the actual bottom of the syringe. Oops. And what you need to do is, once again, rinse the syringe in a similar way that we did before by putting buffer or water or cleaning solution through, and also remove your sample from the sample cell. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if everything goes well with your experiment, you probably don't need to clean vigorously. Usually I clean with buffer, water, and if necessary, we have a detergent called Contrad 70 because you really wanna keep the ITC clean Otherwise, you'll have spurious data. I don't know if that's the way I want to say it. But anyway, bad data. 